Transylvanian Sunrise By Radu Sinemar with Peter Moon Chapter 2, Department Zero In 1980, thirteen years after this occult department had been established in the Securitate, several objectives were achieved that enabled a clearer picture of the policy to be followed towards fulfilling the purpose for which the department had been created. At the beginning, Ceausescu's whim to set up the department had created much confusion and many teething problems. In the 1980s, however, a pretty well-defined organizational structure had been set in place and adequate logistical concerns were satisfied. In fact, financing had been a hot issue from the very beginning as Ceausescu, in an apparently inexplicable manner, had forgotten to make clear how funding would be secured. On the other hand, Nobody had been brave enough to shatter the confusion of the early days. In front of the communist dictator, any such venture would have been tantamount to defiance or at least incompetence. Both interpretations would have incurred great problems for and put an end to the career of any enterprising spirit. The funding method was the one that was usually applied in extreme cases, the absolute order of the head of the state would be invoked and funding would be secured by collecting from amounts available to other fields. That was the compromise employed for the first three years after the department had been set up. With the passage of time, things changed for the better and two secret operational bases were made available, one located close to the town of B, and the other in the Retezit Mountains. A short distance away from Velia Ursului, a fictional town used to protect the real location. Due to the fact that a logistics base of sorts had been growing since the department had been set up, as of 1972, new fund attraction tactics were employed consisting of repeated diplomatic interventions with Ceausescu at carefully chosen moments. Convinced and even enthusiastic about the prospects that the development of the department could have offered, he gave instructions that Department Zero be financially supported by two fictitious companies in Uruguay. These companies were passed off as intermediaries of oil businesses in official papers but were in fact specialized in laundering proceeds from the illicit transactions of the Latin Mafia. Revita Unio and Nan and Company were the two companies that provided fabulous amounts of money for the Ceausescus, being managed at that time by a real genius in the field. This was General Mears, a man I had the opportunity of meeting personally. He is probably one of the few people who had a correct intuition, long before the final stage of the end of the communist system in Europe and of Ceausescu's downfall or, more accurately, of the circumstances in which that was to happen. Mark my words, Radu dear, he said. There are unsuspected forces at play eating at the root of this, people serving the smokescreen and undermining Ceausescu, his conceited impulses, the economy, and they don't operate from within but my and my family's future is secured. Notorian from the Securitate knows all that, but I'm too well placed to be deposed. I don't think this situation can continue for more than two or three years from now. This discussion took place sometime in 1988 and I must admit that it was somewhat portentous because, in an upsurge of inspired rhetoric, the general then surmised that Ceausescu had no chance of making a clean escape from the fury of the people and that the same occult forces, which he would not name back then, would hatch not only his downfall but also the gradual takeover of power. The subsequent political and economic evolution of the country confirmed his words with a vengeance. Mears made a sudden disappearance in 1989, shortly before the revolution. He could not have chosen a better moment since the commotion that gripped the communist system in the Europe of those times did not allow the necessary time for a thorough investigation to find the traitor as the usual procedure would have required. Although he relied on his huge influence and secret power, acting almost always in the backstage, General Mears had never dropped any hint about the place where he and his family might take refuge. His complex personality made him act like a very strong and influential but practically unseen and unknown puppeteer. I was one of the few people who had access to his close entourage, but even so, I knew almost nothing about him or his very discreet life. His sense of self-preservation, his refined ego and exceptional intuition in business led to his remarkable financial success in the management of the two companies. These, in turn, 
had been set up due to his very strong diplomatic relations on which Ceausescu himself would sometimes fall back on to achieve various ends. Though a mere rumor at the beginning, it is now a certainty in the upper corridors of power that Mears was the main character who saw to the opening and replenishment of the controversial financial account of the Ceausescus, the value of which was estimated at approximately $1 billion. It is only the general and perhaps two or three other people who know exactly how much money was deposited in that account and what its current situation is this being an issue with enormous interests at play. It is nevertheless easy to assume that General Mears, whom Ceausescu had given a free hand when fully entrusting him with the task of managing the two fictitious companies in Uruguay, did not stop at replenishing the dictator's personal account but also lined his own pockets with huge amounts of foreign currency. Ceausescu might have been aware of this but that was the only instance when he did not take punitive measures since his own financial interest was at stake, and identifying an equally suitable replacement would have been difficult and also very sensitive. One can therefore surmise that a tacit and mutually advantageous agreement had been established between Mears and Ceausescu, with each pretending not to be interested in the thoughts of the other. That is why the position of General Mears in the political and economic machinery of the state was entirely special and those who knew him regarded him as a kind of grey eminence. In a way, Mears was indestructible and as far as I am aware, that was the only situation Ceausescu accepted without any comment in his entire career as communist dictator. It is most likely that, at present, Mears lives his golden age on one of the Balearic Islands or in the splendors of Crete, watching from a distance, a malicious smile on his face the workings of power in Bucharest. From a different perspective, Romania lost a man of exceptional organizational and decisive abilities. General Mears might have been one of the main pillars of the state but at the same time, it is almost certain that he was in on certain secrets which made him retire before his time. His intuition and diplomatic experience thus helped him a great deal in retiring at the best possible moment. Ceausescu ordered that Department Zero be financed generously from the funds that Mears managed at the two companies abroad. From 1968 to 1980, Department Zero was led by no fewer than five heads of departments, but of them all, only Colonel Obadia stood out, after his appointment in 1979, by dint of his enterprising spirit and new ideas that helped a lot with improving the activity of the department. As the field of activity of that Securitate department was still relatively obscure at the time and nobody had any experience or ideas about what had to be done. Obadia had the great opportunity of being given great decision-making freedom at a time when the department was made independent and its activities listed under the top-secret category. This implicitly meant that Colonel Obadia's position in the hierarchy of state power was somewhat similar to a minister's position. However, due to his entirely special involvement with the apparatus of the Securitate, the colonel's position was in theory weightier and even more influential, being closer to that of a minister of state, but impossible to wield in the political sphere. In structuring the department of which he was the head, Colonel Obadia followed a simple principle, information should be passed on directly, with recourse to one intermediary at most, and operations run on a skeleton staff. At the same time, however, it was necessary that those who were selected to work for the department be highly competent and even professionals in their fields. The colonel had the instinct that in order to implement those basic ideas, no compromise could be made. He needed special equipment and above all, paramilitary elite specially trained for unusual interventions. Given the protocol associated with his position, Colonel Obadia was one of the few people who had direct and immediate access to Ceausescu, irrespective of the circumstances. Reports were presented to the dictator by Obadia himself and then handed to him on the same day because, as a measure of maximum security, they were typed in one copy and then signed and sealed only by the colonel. His position was so strong that he did not need to explain his actions to anyone other than the president of the state and the head of the securitate. On the other hand, however, he had the power of requesting the assistance and support of any institution in the country. A private phone line was established between him and Ceausescu and information and reports received from Department Zero were categorized as state secrets, classification level, 5, access was only granted to Ceausescu, the head of the Securitate, the chief of staff and, of course, Obadia himself. 
Initially, shortly after being appointed as head of Department Zero, the colonel had presented the dictator with a list of 16 proposals making up the essential infrastructure for a flawless operation of the department. Ceausescu approved them all. Subsequently, however, acting on his specific cunning and his fear that Obedia's power might set a dangerous precedent, Ceausescu created some safety valves. As a consequence, the colonel could no longer act and interfere with all the institutions in the country but only with those operating in fields related to the activity of the department. The limits of this clarification, however, were very fuzzy. One other restriction was that Obadia was no longer allowed access to other state secrets or those of the Securitate apart from classified information emerging from his own department. Finally, when requested, he had to accept the head of the Securitate having the possibility to write fact-finding reports for Ceausescu's use but without the head of the Securitate having any decision-making rights. Still, due to the specificity of the department, those slight, amendments, did not trouble Colonel Obadia much. His excellent performance in the years that followed proved his professionalism and ability to handle the often complicated relations with his subordinates. These extraordinary security measures turned out to be highly efficient even several years after the revolution which proved that Department Zero had been founded on very solid and secure ground. My belief is that the secrets in Department Zero files were better kept than even army secrets or foreign intelligence. Those files were presented to Ceausescu and bore several marks as in the diagram below. After the head of the state took note of the content of the reports and had a summary discussion with Obadia, the file was handed to the colonel and locked away in a special safe in his office located at the operational base in Velia Ursului. Prior to that, the file was sealed with a wide red tape and a lead seal. The tape bore the words. LMI TED Access. 1. President of the Country. 2. The Head OLHIE Zero Department. 3. The Head of Security Series, N0.9, The Secret State Archive. In the thick web of units and departments of the Securitate, the Army and the Ministry of the Interior, Department Zero stood out as an island apart, almost Western in its outlook and separated from the other activities of the state by its very specificity. That was the general framework when Cesar was brought to the secret base close to B, in 1980. By comparison to living standards back home, Cesar had access to all the comfort and exceptional technical equipment at the base. The design and the construction of the base had been entrusted to a specialized company in the United States and the technology and equipment ordered and imported from the Netherlands. The building had been made operational almost one year before shortly after Colonel Obadia had been appointed head of the department. It had two main bodies, one earmarked for the staff and routine activities and the other, larger and more sophisticated, earmarked for those who were selected and brought in. The larger area consisted of several apartments, a kitchen, a cafeteria and an isolated laboratory area where experiments were carried out. The base area was surrounded by a high concrete wall and access in the neighborhood was restricted within a 100-meter range under military guard. Apparently, the entire area had all the marks of a simple military unit arousing neither suspicion nor any special interest. Supplies came in once a week so as to keep contact with the outside world to a minimum. When Cesar arrived, four more subjects were already there, three children and one adult. Each was assigned to one of the style ISH apartments in the main building which they were allowed to leave only at certain hours. Their schedule was not very busy, but security was very strict. There was a staff of ten, nine men and a woman, aged three five to forty years, who acted as advisor to the mysterious Dr. Sheehan. I will not go any further with such details although Cesar did give me a thorough description of the place and its activities. Subsequently, by a combination of favorable circumstances, I was allowed to visit the place and I must admit it impressed me deeply. Even if at that time the base did not serve the same purpose as in the 80s, its activity continued under very strict and secret conditions. Cesar spent five years in that military campus. He quickly realized that his relationship with his parents was probably over for good, but at least the place offered him unsuspected possibilities to develop his special abilities. 
He met his mates either during recreation and sports hours or during Dr. Sheehan's special classes. Each of them was endowed with certain powers which Cesar described to me in brief and with much humor. For instance, one of the children, a boy aged fourteen, stood out by the sheer width of his umbilical cord, about ten centimeters in diameter, covering a large part of his abdomen. Irrespective of weather conditions, he would wear only one pair of thin cotton trousers. His name was Edward. His psychic radiation was so strong that anybody around him felt somewhat uneasy and insecure and even gripped by a feeling of fear, the origin of which was not clear but which shortly became overwhelming. Those sensations were felt when Edward was calm and relaxed, but if for any reason he got angry, small spark-like flashes were visible around his body and particularly around his head. At such moments, the objects in his immediate surroundings would break or get distorted. That was why his apartment was mostly equipped with wooden and plastic objects as those were easier to replace. In summertime, his apartment was connected to a special air cooling system because he could not bear temperatures in excess of 20 degrees Celsius. The air conditioning option was not satisfactory because, as Edward said, though cool, the air was short of its energetic, vital element. In other words, it was dead air bringing more harm than benefits. The boy's main paranormal ability was his telekinetic power which is the ability to set material objects in motion by the sheer force of his will, without touching them. From a distance, Edward was able to lift objects up in the air, maintaining their position or moving them around for minutes in a row. Though not much impressed by his mate's abilities, Cesar nevertheless told me that Edward's greatest achievement came when, following hard concentration, he extracted and lifted a water sphere which he then moved around the room. Another boy, Octavian, almost as old as Cesar himself, did not stand out obviously for having any special gift. His endowment, however, was exceptional in that he could foresee, in broad terms, events that were to take place within a range of ten to twenty hours from the present into the future. I found out that Octavian gradually improved his performance to 28 hours into the future and his predictions were more and more precise. Nevertheless, as Cesar told me, he was never able to go beyond that limit. Officials had a special interest in him which meant the boy enjoyed special treatment. Even during recreation hours, when the children were at play, he was permanently accompanied by a stiff and sturdy man whose task was to supervise that the boy was not making predictions for anybody around. This precaution was quite futile as Octavian was rather lonely, pensive, and even apathetic at times. He was of thin constitution, his eyes deep in their sockets, and often deeply absorbed in thought far away from any outside influence. Cesar described him as a special boy even among those with paranormal powers. That strange ability of his to perceive the future within a certain time range was not simply intuitive as is the case with most people who associate this ability with card reading, coffee reading or any other similar pursuit. Everything that happens, everything that unfolds in this universe, any act, action, thought, emotion or feeling is stored with high fidelity on a sort of subtle support. Cesar told me, thus answering my natural queries. By way of analogy, it is a, a record that can be compared within certain limits with the way in which instances of your life or somebody else's is stored on a photo film when a camera is used. Otherwise, investigating the past or the future wouldn't be possible. I then chipped in, somewhat shyly, but puzzled, and still, how is it possible to get a vision of the future since the future hasn't even happened? Cesar gave a slight smile. 